Hey, welcome back everyone. Rob here from Ram Studio Comics. So in today's video, I'm going to draw a spawn for you, talk a little bit about that process, but I'm going to keep this one in real time. So to do that, I'm also going to have another topic along with this, and the topic of it is going to be uh, how and, and when, you know, kind of how to develop your art style, but, you know, other ideas that can, you know, go with that. Like, so for instance, integrating other art styles into your own some of the things i faced with doing that um so yeah so essentially just as far as starting the process of this one i'm just drawing a circle line down the middle for the direction of the face so this is like the andrew loomis method uh, dividing up the side of the head into quadrants finding the placement of the ear and then going right for the shape of the face so I find this to be good for uh, comic style art. I use the same kind of approach for anything that's a little bit more caricature or stylized, where if I'm going strictly with the Andrew Loomis method, I'm gonna keep it more stiff and uh, more structured. But I tend to find that if I stay too much to that structured side, I get a little bit less creative vibe to the work. So I've been really experimenting more with going right to head shapes but I find it's a bit of a mix too because if I don't do any structure, I suffer more with uh, asymmetry and, and things like that. So I need a little bit of structure, but uh, not, you know, I can't overdo it. It's, you know, it's, everything's a balance, right? So going for the, uh, the suit, you know, the big collars. Uh, Spawn's got lots of style, so he likes to pop those big collars. <laughs> My attempt at humor there. And, um, you know, so drawing those in with big, large uh, shapes, obviously, the bow down the back, the points up to the front. Um, one thing I will say about this character, if I had to pick, like, overall shape language going in, even though this is just a head and shoulder, you know, kind of shoulder area, uh, neck and shoulder, you know, it's, I'm basically thinking triangles and squares. So square uh, shapes represent strength, masculinity, stability, right? Just strong characters, right? Squared off jaws, stuff like that. Squared off head shape, you know, head. Not a square head, but you know what I mean. And then triangles, uh, sharp edges, uh, insinuate or make us think of something dangerous. So again, combining those two shape languages early on in my mind is kind of what I'm doing here as I develop the sketch. And um, another thing I want to make sure to mention with the sketching process and I say this a lot, but I, I think it's worth, uh, you know, saying again, is allow yourself to be loose, gestural, draw light, change things. I mean, just even, you know, when I, when I say change things, you know, if you got something that's working, maybe you're a little less likely to change it. But keep in mind that making changes is almost always going to get you to some better idea that you're not thinking on the forefront of your mind. So I think it's very important to go into the sketching process with the intent to make some changes. Even if you think you're doing the best thing imaginable, you might want to at least see it from one other uh, direction. And the reason why I think that that's so true and that we don't always see that is because as soon as you work with a group setting of people, they almost always challenge you, almost always. I'll say always. They always challenge you to do something from another perspective. I noticed that when I worked in team settings with storyboards, and I'd always be kind of ticked about it, but I'd always, almost always, get to something better. So you have to kind of think that way. Even if you're in this studio by yourself doing your own thing, you kind of have to challenge yourself almost like you're working with a group of other individuals that are like, yeah, I like it, but <laughs> it's kind of silly, but I'm telling you it works. So Anyways, I just wanted to share that about the sketching process because it's easy for us to become complacent when the only one that we have to please is ourselves. And then we go to share the work and we wonder why we get lackluster results because we really just didn't explore as much. I feel like I should have explored even this basic head and bust shot. I should have explored it to make it more exciting. So again, I'm not just talking to you. I'm, uh, I'm kind of smacking myself in the head at the same time. So again, with the uh, very sharp angles, uh, obviously his mask is very sharp, and you know I think that that was uh, very smart on the part of good old Todd McFarlane to, to make the mask look very uh, scary like that with the sharp angles and the, the kind of spooky vibe overall of the character. Um, all those things make him just a great design, you know, memorable and very fun character to draw, right? 
So now I've got pretty much the sketch laid in. I um, can't remember if I start sketching the skulls here. Yeah, so I start sketching the skulls and I, I really just block them in fast. And, and that's another thing I want to say is like when you are sketching, try to like get the stuff in loose, gesturally, and fast. And sometimes drawing faster is a good thing. Other times you have to slow down. If you're getting like a weird piece of art, it could be that you're just, you really focus too much on moving fast. Adjusting your speed when you're drawing really can do a lot, I found. Um, sometimes the ideas are flourishing, and then speed is great because, you, again, you're getting that loose, energetic sketch out. But if the idea is not there, you kind of need to slow down and let, uh, you know, your hand and, and brain coordinate and sync up or something. I don't know. But there's times I definitely feel the need to speed up, and there's other times I need to slow down. And drawing these skulls, I felt like that. Like, I or just pull reference is another thing if you're not getting them right but i end up redrawing them and getting them somewhat the way i want but uh yeah i wasn't really feeling them right there and, and it's almost immediate when i do that i know immediately when i'm even in the sketch I'm like something's not right here should i press forward maybe not should i redraw it definitely so like um and, and i will say sometimes it's not just redrawing it over the sketch a lot of times that feel, i feel like that works Sometimes it's going to a blank sheet of paper and redrawing it fresh because if you have that sketch in front of you, not always, sometimes it can you can retrace your bad steps. It's almost like you started down a path and each time you draw over it, I've done this before like multiple times drawing over it and I, I just keep drawing the same bad art. It's almost like I saw something and I can't unsee it. So to do that, when you feel that happening, you go to a fresh sheet of paper. And the reason why I say this is when I used to draw my, my panels and my pages on regular paper, uh, I would flip the board over and draw on the other side when I was struggling with something. And I think that was actually more beneficial to me getting through that hindrance I was facing in the art. So give that a shot. Obviously here, just converted it to blue line and uh, getting ready to start drawing over it. I was actually gonna draw over it one more time. So sometimes I'll do this where I refine it another time. And then other times I'm like, why am I doing this? I should just ink it. It's digital. There's nothing to be afraid of. Jump in, do the thing. And so that's what I do here. I mess around with the brush settings a little bit. I start drawing it, but then I, I bump down the opac or I bump up the opacity of the brush and I just go for inking the work. Mainly too, because this is a character I've drawn countless times. Uh, it's not like I really need to have the the uh, you know, training wheels on here and, and basically re redraw it a couple times. Um, I, I will say there's some times that I feel like that's beneficial and I enjoy doing that. And then there's other times I think that it's just better to go for it and then allow yourself to work through it and be creative along the way, like especially digital and, and even with traditional. You got white out. You You don't have to really worry too much. If you can get yourself in the realm of of what you're looking for, chances are being creative with the tools in front of you and maneuvering through it will give you better results, will make it look more interesting. Um, it's a tough pill to swallow because it's it almost feels like, well, if I can't see it yet, how would I just go to dropping in some, some cleaner lines? One of the things is you start with a thinner line. You know, start with a nice thin line. Uh, sometimes I forget to do this, but I notice that it helps to, to do two things with the line. Start it thin, even hold back on your line weight for a little bit if you have to. And uh, so start it thin and even break up the lines. Something about that is almost like you're piecing together a little puzzle and it gives you a little bit more time to think about it and see it come together. Uh, and again, if something's in the wrong area, chances are if you've got the sketch pretty good, not, not super tight, but pretty good, that you can nudge things around and fix it anyways. You don't, you don't need these big drastic changes. I find that when, when I start doing that, I'm kind of out of the zone a little bit. You know, and I start making these big massive decisions one side of the next and moving things around all of a sudden I'm, I'm all over the place. And then it's, then it fell apart. But if I start with those thin lines, I'm in the kind of in the realm, I can usually maneuver. Now digital, I can maneuver all over the place. It's, it's a lot easier ball game. But again, I don't like to say just digital or just traditional. I like all the different methods of creating. 
and there's times I've done it with uh, whiteout and ink pens and it works out just fine as well. It's really the same concept. It's just digital. You got a lot. You got an infinite amount of whiteout, obviously. And you can select something and move it, which makes it super easy. Uh, but I try not to do that. I actually want to get away from doing that because I want the, my tools to function as much like traditional art tools as, as insanely po as, as possible so that I'm not up a creek when you know my power goes out or something. But yeah, again, use that thin line, kind of uh, maneuver it, um, hold back. The reason why I said hold back on line weight too, because typically I jump in right here, and you see I did it with the eye right there. So I'm, I'm like kind of combining steps. So if you had to really itemize this down and break it down, it'd be like really thin, broken up lines, do all that, drop in some of your, your core, you know, your basic shadows, do all that, uh, drop in some line weight, do all that. Like you would really stage it. And I think that that's another way to make this stuff easier on yourself. Uh, once, once you've done it for so long, you kind of start grouping things together and skipping steps. So be careful of that because it can make it a little bit harder to process. Now, if you got a lot of experience, it's not a big deal because you're just kind of like, oh, I've done this so many times. I'm just going to ink this whole area and then I'll move on to the next area. You're not really as bothered by it. But there's something about breaking things down into, you know, bite-sized chunks or whatever that make it a little bit easier to process, keep you on point. Uh, so if you're a little bit more new to this stuff, definitely take advantage of that because again, it's very easy to watch people. I'm not saying myself, but, you know, there's way more advanced artists out there that you could be looking at, but it's very easy to watch them and think that they're just better. Uh, you know, they got more experience and they're skipping steps and you're trying to do that and you can't, but you're not, you know, you're not comparing apples to apples. They're, they're skipping steps because they've done so, so many countless revisions of that type of work that in their mind they're not even skipping steps anymore it's just kind of natural so be careful again that's why comparisons can be super unhealthy in almost anything because you really don't know the you know the background story of these other people that you're comparing to so be you know again be care very very leery of comparisons Okay, and at this stage, I'm also adding little bits of texture. Now, the thing that you can't see, and I just want to make sure to point it out, and maybe you see it, maybe you don't, but, you know, I've got a fair amount of pressure sensitivity on this brush. I'm using a Cintiq, by the way, and I'm using Photoshop this time. I usually don't use Photoshop, but I just felt like using something different. Um, it's all the same. Once you get your brush settings working, you know, it's the thick to thin, the pressure curve on your Cintiq or whatever comparable device you're using, uh, you're just looking for that line variation. The other thing is you can just keep your fingers on the bracket keys, left and right bracket keys, and you basically toggle the brush size up and down. Uh, I've seen people that actually disable the pressure curve altogether on the, um, the brush, and they just use the bracket keys with a flat, solid line. It's kind of funny, but it makes sense because if you think about like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, micron. A micron doesn't have very, um, you know, very much range. It's it's kind of the way that you use it. It's a pretty flat line overall. It's got a little bit of thick to thin, but not a ton. Uh, so, if you think about that, it's really just the way that you use it. So, what I mean to say by that really is just be careful not to give too much credit to a certain custom brush. Now, this is coming from somebody that makes custom brushes. I have a bunch of them on my Gumroad. Of course, you know, I could sit there and say it's all about the brush, but I want you to have more faith in your own ability and utilize all the brushes in different ways. A lot of times just scaling them up differently and playing around with the pressure curve can yield massive results and nothing really beats just time on the job, right? Just like using a micron at first, you're like looking at it and going, why doesn't my micron work like this artist is using it, you know, it's, mine's broke. No, it's not broke. It's just they've been using it a lot longer and it's gonna take you time to develop those same uh, types of mechanical motor skill controls uh, with that, dev that not device, but that uh, art supply, that tool. So yeah, just again, a lot of times it's being patient with yourself so that you can figure that stuff out. All right, so here's starting to draw in the light source. So. What I like to do here is at least make sure that I, I move that line around. So it'd be real easy for me to just do a curve that matches his head. 
and, and then a curve that matches the cheek and the, the chin and all that good stuff. But what I notice is that if I can bounce that line around, uh, really like, you know, different variations of thick to thin, definitely showing more of a thickness or a gap of light on the front of the head where the light source is heaviest and then way thinner on the back. But even notice with the jaw and the chin, I'm, I maneuvered it where it's not all even. And I really could have took that even further. Uh, I really suggest you play around with that. So I think it's called rim lighting or edge lighting or whatever. But I used to always make it like this similar distance and thickness around the shape. And all it did was basically make that shape look really flat. So you can really just play around with that. And, and notice it's a real bumpy kind of wavy line. Uh, it's Again, you can explore lots of variation in that. Um, Somebody comes to mind that does that really well is uh, Ivan Rice, Reese, Ivan Rice, I believe. Uh, he The way he does his shapes of shadows are so relatively sporadic from what I, what I would compare to a lot of other artists, but it works so well. It looks very organic. Uh, so, yeah, at any rate, I'm just trying to explain some of my thought process as I develop light and shadow, as I cut into areas, and, you know, obviously the character's you know, filled pretty heavily black. And I've seen some artists that do a lot less of that, show more area for the colorist to do their thing. Uh, but I, I tend to like this character more filled in. And then you'll see I'll go back with uh, some negative lines, kind of like white out, but it's just basically me taking the same brush and I hit uh, X on the keyboard, which for Photoshop, it flips the color swatches. So I'm essentially just using one brush. I could play around with a lot of variation there, obviously and going back and drawing dark to light, dark to light, and building up on it. I find it to be a very fast and effective way to work, and I don't have to think a whole lot about it, which, you know, for me is kind of cool. Okay, so here, just dropping in the shadow from behind his head, and uh, there is another technique for areas like this. I'm using a Cintiq, and I really could throw these lines and get them probably cleaner. I do a lot of this, like, stutter step line connecting stuff, yeah, I find it to work just fine. It's it's a little bit messier of a process, but you know, you'll see there's people that get really good at using more of their elbow and throwing these big long curves. I do it for some things like uh hair on women. I'll, I usually do it there, but and I probably should have did it here honestly, and I think that's why I'm mentioning it because it almost looks like I'm working too hard <laughs> to do some of these areas. Uh so it's funny how just the mechanics of how you draw really do come into play. There's times when you're like you know, I just do it a certain way out of a bad habit. And there's other times when, uh, you you know, you see somebody else doing it, it looks way easier. And it's really just that they've developed a little bit better use of the mechanics. Now, on the back of the head here, notice when I talked about that, that rim light being too awfully even, I really noticed how it made the head look weird and flattened it out. So all I did is I, you know, I had the black blend together a little bit on the back of the head just so it looks like his head's kind of submerging into the darkness just a little bit more. So again, just little things that you can edit along the way. And, and one of the things I will say about working with a very, um, I don't know, organic approach or a mindset that things can just be fixed and be a little better, not massively better. They don't have to, you know, be the next best thing you've ever drawn every single time. But if you can go into it going, how can I make this a little better? Just a little better. I feel like if you learn to nudge your art along the way like that, it, it's a lot less likely for you to to like give up or something. Like you're you're not looking to um, you know draw the very best picture you've ever drawn, but you're also not going to give up on it. You're going to keep just making these little adjustments. And again, digitally, it's a lot easier to kind of get that mentality, I think. But at the same time, you really need it with traditional and or digital it's not one or the other uh, because a lot of times when you learn to just think on your feet be creative with your process and develop the art as you go and and get those little you know those little wins if you want to call them like as you're maneuvering through it you're like oh, i think i could fix this i think i could save this because you can you could save anything if you put your mind to it but if you get like very discouraged and all of a sudden you're like oh i just gotta start over that is a really bad habit to get into. I found myself in that situation plenty of times. So I'm just trying to share that with you that it's really cool if you can like lighten up on yourself and just go, 
Man, I bet I can make this a little better. You know, I bet I could tweak this right here and it'll really make this part of the design pop, you know, and, and have that uh, easy going vibe, you know, that's that's kind of that ebb and flow concept to me anyways, is like when I feel myself in that ebb and flow, it's usually because I'm having a good time and I'm not like stressed about the work. Now, it is easier to get in that state of mind, I think, when you're drawing a character you absolutely love to draw. A couple things happen there. One, you're feeding off the energy of that character. You got tons of great reference. That makes it easier, obviously. But if you really enjoy the character, like so for me, it's Spawn, Spider-Man, Hulk, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. Actually, I still struggle to draw Hulk. But the other two, I, I could definitely feed on the energy of those characters. And it's easier for me to draw them. It's, it's more exciting for some reason. The trick is, is if you're drawing a character you're not that excited about, say it's a commission or something like that, utilizing that same energy and then pulling that over into your, your, your you know, the piece that you're not as, as uh, generally excited about. That's trickier to do, but it's possible. And, and the way I found to do it is like you start sketching the ones you really like, the ones you're really passionate about, and then you maneuver over to that uh, other piece. If you practice that enough, you will pull some of that energy over and be able to get it done. Uh, another thing is just the warm-up sketches. So I, I do a lot of different pose practice in the morning, and I, I fell away from doing that, and I started to see my art suffer. Uh, and, and what I've been doing lately is very tiny, tiny little thumbnail sketches. And you know, I've talked a lot about this as well, the importance of it. It really does help. Uh, you get to explore so many different ideas so much faster that you really can't beat it. It is an excellent way to warm up, I think. And I, so I do just a lot of like bad doodles, uh, almost sometimes what looks like they would be <laughs> abstract or something. Uh, and I think that helps as well, even abstract doodles, so that you're not always so f intently focused on drawing a specific thing, but even just kind of getting in the, the rhythm of, of drawing itself um, and sometimes you come up with neat ideas just by doing abstract doodles anyways. So uh, it can really help with uh, ideas of composition and all sorts of stuff. But just texturing, you know, the te you know, texturing by itself can look pretty abstract. So, And right here at this stage of the work, I start struggling with this little part of the illustration. Just this little bit of the cape on the one side. It's kind of silly that I would even struggle with this, but here I am. And I like to point out those areas when I am struggling. I mean, you know, it's not like the entire piece is me just going through it and everything's just chiming the way that I want. But what I'm saying is like when I do hit those areas where I really just struggle, like it's almost like I just tripped or something. Uh, it, it's like a mental barrier and, and it happens randomly to me. Uh, it'll be a, a direction of a flow of a, of a certain thing or all of a sudden the shapes just aren't doing well like I, like I hoped. I was using uh, X and, and going back and forth from light to dark so maybe you hopefully can tell that and sometimes that'll help but sometimes the best recipe uh, to get through something like that is to stop dinking with it and stop messing with it all together. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll try my hardest for a little bit uh, then I'll try not so hard. That's another thing. I try to quit like Again, being so intently focused on it for a second, see if that resets my brain box. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I just have to go away from it. And, and sometimes just going to the other side of the artwork. So not necessarily leaving the artwork or anything like that, but just going to the other side. And that's what I felt sort of helped here. Another thing is flipping the artwork, if, if you can. Uh, and again, if you're working traditionally, just, you know, light box it, whatever. But try to flip it. And sometimes the patterns will work better in reverse. So it's, it's little things like that, trying to rethink your game plan and realizing that you have a few different approaches uh, so they don't feel backed into a corner, which can you know, lead to more frustration and ultimately make you think that you can't complete uh, that certain task at hand. And another thing not to overlook, obviously, is if you can find specific content tailored to that thing that you're battling. So in this case, capes. Uh, I've done videos on it, but uh, one that I just watched, it was really informative, uh, is by David Finch. And so, 
you know, we're lucky that there's so much tailored content to, again, specific areas of the work that you might be struggling with. So sometimes it's just stopping and looking through the art books or, you know, YouTubing a video uh, and, and, again, making good use of your time so that you're not always just fighting the uphill battle just for the sake of pride, uh, that you are being, you know, a steward of your time and effort because uh, it's the one thing you don't get any more of, right? You got to be methodical about the use of your time because it's just it's there's only so much of it and you don't really want to just work hard for the sake of working hard there's times that that builds work, hard work ethic which is insanely uh, valuable but then there's other times you just want to be you know work smart not hard and as i mentioned earlier in the video sometimes you just need to get that bad sketch out of the way uh, so that you're not retracing uh, the same series of steps that might not be working for you I would say most of the time I do better with the previous sketch layer in front of me, uh, but that's also why it's deceiving because I'm like, oh, that's just my routine every single time. No, it's not. It's most of the time. And then sometimes I need to do something a little different and then I flow right through it. So again, I think it's important to be like organic in your approach and, and, you know, move like water, you know, Bruce Lee style. Like you got to you got to flow from one thing to the next. And if, if you feel that, that that hindrance, you know, that, that stop of that flow, you got to rethink things and kind of reapproach it and, and uh, you know, mess around, do something different for a minute, come back, all that good stuff. But here, you know, I'm just dropping in like little bits of shadow. Uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about too, because uh, there's really only so much I can really discuss about the artwork. Most of it's done. We're almost to the rendering stage. I wanted to bring you this one in real time because people have been requesting that. So hopefully uh, you do enjoy this longer content. But something else I figured I would talk about is introducing other styles and developing your style based upon uh, other, you know, influences. And and so so for me, big influences, if you don't already know, are like uh, McFarlane. That's why I chose to do Spawn. I always, always kind of like think about those days when I picked up my first few comics and I was so impressed by the artwork that I had already been drawn, but I was like, wow, I think I want to be a comic artist or I know I want to be a comic artist. And I just started drawing from those pictures and recreating everything I could get my eyes on uh, to try to learn to, you know, to do what these people were doing. Uh, so Todd McFarlane was huge in that regard. And, and the very first one that I really latched on to to start you know trying to emulate that style of art and the funny thing is i felt like i was learning at an extremely fast rate and all i was really doing was copying pictures out of spider-man one two and three and so to me those were like art books and he was just one of my art teachers uh, other ones are like you know david finch uh, jim lee um dale kian and and I have a I have a really long list I, I do but those are those are the big ones I mean um, it's just like but again I could go on and on with ones that I look at for certain things so like I've mentioned before like when it comes to shadows I really admire David Finch's work and and I admire it on so many levels but that's one of the things like I'm assume almost like immediately when I'm struggling with shadows I want to go look at his work. With McFarlane, it's like a sense of organic flow and movement and, and, and use of texture and almost like a a, uh, a freedom of expression is, is one of the things I, I think about with his. So it's so so like organic and malleable. Like it's it's just it has such a great freedom of expression to it. Like like he almost just looks like he's throwing lines and, and shapes wherever he wants, but it just works. So when I when my characters are too stiff and lifeless, I go I look at his work, and I think it's really important to have these these people that you can say that's my go-to for this or that like like so for poses I don't know why but I can seem to and I I don't want to sound uh, uh, egotistical or presumptuous I don't know what the word is but I don't want to sound like a jerk bag like when I, I go to Jim Lee's work when I want to draw poses better like like I for some reason I feel like I can translate his pose work I don't know if it's because I watched so many of his videos where he's drawing uh, different things and explaining it uh, it might be that 
um, I don't know, it's, it's easier to relate for me. Like I struggle more to do poses from, from somebody like McFarlane or uh, like I love Dale Keenan stuff, but I can't draw poses like he can for, for the Hulk. It always comes out wonky. Um, it's just weird. So again, it's knowing like these, these things about your inspirations and going, well, I can go there and I can kind of grab some ideas for shadows. I can go there and I can I love the way they use perspective. And I think it's super important to be able to not only know that, you know, where you can get these inspirations and these ideas from, but also not fighting it too much when you're just not getting it. Like you just got to say, all right, to heck with it. I'm going to set my pride aside and I'm going to go there and I'm going to swipe some art. <laughs> it sounds so bad, but I think it was Picasso and I'm probably going to slaughter this, but it was something like a good artist copies, a great artist steals. We've all heard... The, well, I'm probably getting it wrong, but the, we've all heard that that um, quote, and I think he got it from somebody else. But but the thing is, the main thing is, is if somebody in these artists of high high caliber say things like that, and obviously uh, quotes are subjective to how you interpret the meanings and things like that. So you got to research that and see what that means to you. What it means to me is that you just got to be smart and learn and grow from everything around you. And in the stealing part is that you, this is going to sound bad the way I put it, but I'm going to say it like this, learning to cover your tracks. Okay, now that sounds bad because really what you're supposed to do is just learn a bits and pieces of this work and not, you know, swipe it, steal it, really, literally in a sense. But that's, that's if you were to copy it more line for line, shape for shape, you just change a couple little things and call it your own. And, and never give credit to somebody. So like if you do a homage cover, you've seen plenty of those, right? I love homage covers. I want to do some for the channel here, by the way. That's something I got on my list uh, for upcoming content. And nobody gets mad about a homage cover, but it's a clear, uh, defend, you know, you can tell it's from a specific popular cover. And you also give credit to the artist at the bottom, right? So it's, it's totally fair play. Um, it makes it to publish work, everything. It's not like it's just a, 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 you know, fun fiction kind of thing. It's like, no, they, they make big covers out of these, but it's done in a way where people are like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. I like that cover too. You know, like, so, so that's okay. Um, but the swiping and stealing part is just basically bits and pieces and, and you combine them together with your own, your own interpretation and your own style. Um, but but it's so much smarter of a way to work. Uh, again, I'll reference David Finch. You know, you got to check out his channel if you haven't. Seen, I'm sure you've watched his channel. You watch his channel, but um, he talks about you know how to take cues from other artists and put it into your work. And and I think that if you really have a you know a few different inspirations at any given time, um, and maybe I could be using that word wrong, but you know, when you utilize other work around you and life, in my opinion, things around you, and you know when to grab bits and pieces when you're not getting something, you're going to be so much faster. You're going to be you're going to be learning so much quicker because you're standing on the shoulders of giants in a in a sense. Like you're you're learning from these people that have done it right and professionally and well for so long. But instead of like just copying one whole picture and it's like they're holding your, you know, this is why I don't copy an entire picture. I do it every now and then just for fun because that's how I started it. When I initially started comics, I would copy entire pictures. That's just how I learned. And it was, and I felt like I was really good. <laughs> it was so funny because it gave me this feeling like I was really good. No, the artist I was copying from was really good. I was just copying. But, but at the same time, that's how I think a lot of us begin. And, and then we get that initial sense of completion and, and excitement from it. Um, but over time, uh, I would just take, you know, a little bit from this one, a little bit from that one, uh, and then and then put that stuff away and, and, you know, take the training wheels off, right? And then go go back to just drawing from, uh, you know, from, from my own mind. Uh, but I definitely had that, uh, that buildup of different things. And then because of that, the work is going to come out better. You're going to learn faster and you, you stop fighting yourself. So, and that's why I mentioned pride. I think that for me, it's always been a pride thing. Like I want to just draw this from 
my own imagination and you know i want people to see how good i i can do this thing or whatever you know how good how bad but and then all of a sudden i i fight through all this part these parts i'm not getting and i just put out something that's less quality than it could have been where had i stopped and said no the perspective sucks here i need to learn perspective well i don't have time to learn perspective today uh and I'd like to get a piece out by tomorrow or whatever, you know, I, I like to get things out relatively fast, you know, a day or two tops. But so I just go where, you know, I pick up my comics. I pick up, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that's got a lot of book. Uh, what are they called? Graphic novel, <laughs> you know, where there's a collection of the, the books together. Those are the best because you can you can open them up and just cover so much ground of, of a particular artist. Um and then flip through that, find a perspective that works, it's dynamic, that's impressive, and you're like, whoa, that, that's it, that's what I need. And just take the perspective. Like, I've never once heard anybody say, oh man, that's, that perspective's ripped off from such and such. You've never heard that. And I've never heard that, you probably never hear that. It's only until you take like so much from one piece that it's like, and again, not giving credit and saying I got it from here, but you know, just taking so much from one piece. That's the part you got to be careful of. Which still, if you're learning, uh, just do it. I mean, it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. And you're, you're going to, again, you're going to learn and grow so much faster. You're going to develop your style, especially if you, um, you know, you, you look at a variety of artists, you're going to develop um, more style by mixing those together, uh, in my opinion. I mean, I think everybody... I don't want to say think. I know everybody is just a, uh, you know, a smorgasbord of of other artists in in life. That's all it is. I mean, art imitates life. We imitate other artists. You know, we we aspire to be. We learn and grow from from looking at other people's work and and challenging ourselves to do things similar to that. It's just part of it. Um, so yeah, it's it's just one of those things where. I think there's a lot of negativity surrounding the concept of it. And it's like, well, it's just a, a, real, a right way and a wrong way. And, and true, you know, you, again, you probably don't want to copy somebody's work entirely and definitely don't want to do that and, and say, not say you did it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's entirely cool if you say, hey, this is just me learning. And I'll tell you what, by the end of it, I learned this, this, and this. You share that, no one's going to get mad at you. Uh, but the, the cool thing is, is when you can say, all right, I'm going to get my shadows from this guy. I'm going to get my, my composition from this guy. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the line art from this girl. And I'm going to get the, the, you know, the coloring from this person over here. And, and you just, again, you put it all together. And then you put your own flair with it, your own distortions, your own transformations. To, you know, you don't just keep it. You learn to, like adjust it on the fly and, it, and it's the same thing with your own work like when you run into a stumbling block you learn things about yourself to get through those bad areas you, you're like okay i i seem to trip up every time i do you know capes and, and why is that well, well i'm gonna sit down and i'm gonna draw capes for a couple days straight you know and, and that by itself might sound like that's it that's all i gotta do that'll help it doesn't mean you're just going to solve the riddle in your mind that is capes. <laughs> that's, that sounds funny, but, but you know, you need more than that. You need source material. You need to understand why you're not getting it. Chances are you just don't understand the mechanics and the flow and the, you know, the energy of capes and the folds and something's missing in your, your approach and, and your thought process. Well, you need more data and, and it's not just the, the act of drawing. I mean, it's definitely a big part of it. But you need to take in the data so you find somebody that does it really well. You look at their content and, and you redraw that over and over again. And then you put it away and you try to draw it from your mind again. You find yourself hitting that same little roadblock. You pick it back up, do it again. Look at three other artists, draw it from them. I mean, that's just the kind of dedication this stuff takes. And, and if you're doing that and you're not getting better then you know ask those questions but explain that to people like i'm doing this i'm doing that you know but i think a lot of times people aren't doing that and that's why they're not seeing themselves improve i know there's times i think i'm i'm doing stuff like that but then i look at my work my sketch pads 
and I, I'm, I've panned back a bit. I like to date all my stuff, and I'm like, no, I've been slacking. That's why right now I'm back on drawing poses every morning. That always seems to help. And it's really silly that I know that about myself. And then I'll go on these large uh, gaps of time where I just get up and start drawing the next piece that I want to draw. And it suffers. And I'm like, why do I keep doing that? Well, it's called a bad habit. <laughs> it's just that's why they're there. They just they just rear their ugly heads and we jump right back into the bad habit that we know we're doing. And yeah, so it's like start the day with some basic shapes, some some foreshortened arms and legs, but draw them really small. Like that's what I did this morning. I drew these suckers almost indistinguishable. They were so tiny. Uh and and then I blow them up and I'll refine them here and there as well, just because I want to see if it works. It usually always works. Like it's something about drawing really small and exploring like a vast amount of ideas very quickly. You just can't beat it. it if you're anything like me, it, you know, because I can't say this is going to apply to everybody. You might be like, ah, I try that. It's, you know, it sucks. It's, it's fine. I mean, we're not all the same, but but at the same time, um, I can't see how it wouldn't work for 99% of people because again. You're exploring a ton of ideas quickly where if you draw bigger you just can't seem to do that it takes longer you got to cover more ground and you're also seeing it from from a distance way away because a lot of the times our problem is is we're zeroing in way too fast on on our work you know we're, we're getting in there way too close and we can't see the composition and the shapes working together uh, i love drawing big uh, because of the detail I can get in there like I sometimes I do these big poster boards but every you know every one of them I see glaring mistakes with the uh, um, the proportions it's just because I'm too close to it for too long you know I need to start way back and you know, run across the room look at it run back over and I should do that I could use the exercise but yeah anyways it's it's just one of those things where you know you find these things out about your process and uh, and then you gotta go back and you almost have to t if you're you know you almost have to take notes because if you're like me again you will go back into the habits that you got past at a previous date and time like man I beat that like last year why am I doing that again you know it's a bad habit it's gonna take time to you know well, it shouldn't take a year but it could you know you just have to keep fighting it so. And you can even see here with the skulls, uh, I erased those entirely, redrew another sketch. It's a bad sketch, but it was just a new sketch, a different approach, and I immediately was able to draw through it much better. So even though, again, a lot of things I'm talking about here, it's kind of hard because I really mean these to apply to big elaborate pieces, you know, the ones that are a lot more moving parts in, in, in essence. You know, nothing's moving on your drawing, but at the same time, uh, that analogy or that uh, association that there's just a lot of things to process on the page. That's where a lot of these things I'm talking about pulling from other inspirations and techniques and, and using those to get through that. That's where it really shows through, but it does apply even to s smaller areas of, a, you know, a simple piece like this, a more static piece. It's, it's usually evident all throughout your work. Um, so if there's enough things going on in the work, generally that's when you're going to see the need to really pay attention to um, you know other artists that, that are just doing these complex scenes really well so that's another thing that uh, you know I don't know that I've mentioned it so far but for instance for me when I do the more complex scenes that's where I, I get a little bit distracted and I, I find it more difficult to focus but then again you go for those artists that do complex scenes all the time and it's like they figured it out. Uh, one thing I will say about that is that what I've noticed, and I do this with my, again, back to my little sketches, I'll do this with my tiny little thumbnail sketches. I can do those complex scenes in a thumbnail just fine. I'll be done with one in five minutes or ten minutes or whatever, and it works there. That's it. That's, that's how you start it. But then I jump to a big page and what do I do? I start trying to draw the whole scene and I start getting flustered. Again, it's starting with that little sketch, doing all the blueprint work there and, and paying attention to when you draw things that are complex, you utilize your overlaps. 
your shapes cover shapes, right? And that your shapes as shadows block out areas. This is something that David Finch does really well. I don't know that he's doing this intentionally. I would imagine he is, but I can't speak for him. But he uses his shapes as shadows in ways where it looks like to me, not only does it improve the composition and make it more exciting, it makes it easier to draw. I remember uh, Jim Lee saying that in one of his, uh, he talked about shadows that way. He also talked about capes that way. It's like uh, something about, I realized that people that did books uh, where the characters had capes, they didn't miss their deadlines. You know, making a funny little quip about how you can cover so much with a big flowing cape. I thought that was super funny, but dude's, dude's hilarious. But, you know, but he's a genius. You know, both those guys are. And that's, you got to take cues from stuff like that. Because it's like, man, am I just leaving too much blank space when I could be improving the composition and saving myself a tremendous amount of time? Yeah, I'll take that out. But it, yeah, it, it just all these things you learn from these people and 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 you realize, wow, that's how they're creating this magic on the page. There's just a lot of cool techniques. There's a lot of cool tricks to this trade. Uh, and, and really, you can't learn it unless you just sit down and get out your notebook and pay attention, your sketchbook and, and your notebook, uh, and just pay attention and listen to them yap and and yeah it's it's kind of neat it really is neat um i can't wait to get back to the the uh conventions but we're lucky that we got all this stuff on youtube there's tons of fantastic content of people doing just that so with the texturing so i should probably talk a little bit about this and again forgive me you guys can let me know if i hey, want to hear more about the art but if i do these real times i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to blab about some other stuff basically but um but with the texturing, one thing I did want to point out, because I get these questions a lot as well, people are always like, well, how do you texture? What choices do you make? I constantly cycle the brush up and down. That's part of it. And then I'm, I'm also, uh, you know, I'm thinking of ways that, that I can break up lines and make it look interesting. Thick to thin is obviously one. Cross hatching is another. You see I'm just dabbing little dots here and there as well. I really got to stress that you just have to free yourself up and add grit and texture to lots of things and then take it in for a bit. Look at it for a bit and see if you like it. There, There's so many ways to introduce that stuff. But one of the things I think about is that I want varying levels and degrees of it. I want there to be like, like I, I see art styles where they do like say the lines I just put on the top left of the cape, right? They're big, thick, they're tapered. Uh, and you see, I, I, I hit those lines a couple times to do that. Uh, maybe I could get a brush to do that all at once, but I don't, I don't typically do that. I use the same brush, I adjust the size of it, and I pull the line multiple times to get it thick to thin. But I'll tell you what, those ones on the left, I'm kind of not digging at this point. I'm sitting there looking at them, like, eh, they're okay, but they give me some variation from the ones that I just put on the inside of the cape. So I was planning that approach, you know, that idea. Because again, I like lots of little variations. I like variations in the line weight that goes around the the um, character. Generally, you want your, your lines around the character to be nice and heavy. The ones on the interior of the face to be thinner and you know lighter by comparison. But really, I just like to maneuver those lines lots of different ways. I don't, I don't like it to look like a flat gradient. So even though I say, Hey, to me, cross hatching is just shadows and gradients and texture. Um, I would say cross hatching is more just gradients. The little stipple shading here and there, and the, and the random lines wherever, that's more like texture. Uh, the ones that I just added on the left of the cowl, I think it's called a cowl, like, there I put more in the middle right there. Those are, that's more of a highlight. Okay, so that's me trying to make that flat shape look like it's rounding a bit because it looks really flat. I mean, that's actually why I'm adding that shadow and that's even why I'm I'm texturing in that area right now. I'm like, wow, that shape looks really flipping flat. Now, if you look at the other side, to me, the one on the right doesn't look so flat. I don't know why, because I actually have less running over there. I think it's that little series of vertically rendered lines that are in that sort of U-like shape. I think those helped more. So I don't know why I didn't just say, all right, that works over there. I'll do that over there. I just don't do that. I bounce around a lot. I apply a lot of different um, little bits of rendering. 
But again, I think it helps to just go crazy with it. Personally, that's that's why I look at it. Just go crazy with it. Somebody will tell you if it's nuts and it doesn't work. But you, you kind of have to explore a lot of different ideas of rendering. Um, but I'm just not a big fan of when all the rendering is the same. It To me, it flattens out a bit. And it, I, just, I just don't find it as interesting. But that's preference. So... Um, yeah, at the end of the day, thick to thin, lots of cross hatching, lots of little broken up lines. And, uh, you know, see, I'm even playing around with sculpting the shadows differently. It's, it's And again, it's basically because that piece right there still looks really flat to me and I'm like not digging it. Um, so that's that's another part of it. I'm just like, how can I round out this part of the art? And I'm, you know, keep messing with it. I'll move away. I'll come back, stuff like that. And then even in the the mask here, I'm looking at it going, yeah, I think I could add some more. I tell you the truth, even after I got done with it, I was I was like, oh, I should have added these other lines here. Like I'm always wanting to add lines, more and more lines. And I know who I get that from. That's that's from you know, well, a combination, but it's it's mainly McFarlane because I I really like the way he throws lines everywhere and he puts these tiny tiny little lines in. And you know what it does to me? It, it makes the piece look bigger. Just like if you draw a city, you can't tell it's a, it's a city until you add the little windows and maybe a little a couple of silhouettes. And the tinier those windows and the tinier the silhouettes of the people, the bigger the city will look. And it's more than that, but it's it's a lot of that, you know, is size comparison. If not, it just looks like big blocks or whatever. You wouldn't know, you know until you see that stuff. And I think the same kind of rule somewhat applies to stuff like this, where you put those tiny little textures, and they, you can't overdo it because a lot of that gets lost, and it has to have the relationship of the bigger stuff, or it just doesn't work. Like you can't just get away with a bunch of thin lines. Uh, there's definitely the the variation that you have to have in there to make it work. But again, that's something that that I like doing. I like adding lots of little, uh, you know, minutia, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, so hopefully uh, this part of the illustrative process has been informative. I know it's been long, but now I'm going to jump to the color. This is a time lapse out of Procreate. So just to reiterate for the few people that are still watching, um, I started this in Photoshop. I don't typically draw on that, but I wanted to you know, change it up a little bit. I find that to help me to be more creative. And then I brought it into Procreate to apply these different colors as I like to do. Uh, I just like coloring sitting on the couch using my iPad Pro. So... Hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. I would love to know what you think. I know it's very long, but again, people were asking for real-time content. Uh, well, minus this part that's time-lapse. But again, thanks so much for watching. Thank you for the support of the channel. Good luck with your art, and I will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.